that. And you can do that with this cosine. So this is a Fourier dictionary. And you can get a really nice reconstruction. There's a little patch taken out. And this will reproduce that fine. But we can see we have to, this is not sparse. There's, all, there's a lot of energy in these components. And so it doesn't tell us anything about the signal. And we can't classify it that way. And so cosine transform works really good for JPEG and helps you squish images. But it doesn't help you learn anything about the images. And so we want to find a dictionary that will both help us squish stuff and classifies at the same time. So if we take collections of, I was mentioning the handwritten digits experiment. This is the MNIST data set. And so they ask people to just write down digits as examples. And then if you learn a dictionary on that, analogous to that Netflix set I was saying before, you get a set like this that has pen strokes. Right? It has little bits of numbers. And so now we sort of have some breakdown. We'll talk about sparse modeling versus compressed sensing. And so this is the kind of the, uh, the meatiest of the slides in some sense. They say every equation cuts the audience in half. And unfortunately, I have two equations uh, on this one, so my apologies. But again, you know, I don't expect anyone to say, oh, yeah, you know, Z minus X, right? That makes so much sense now. But <coughs> what, I, what I really want to emphasize is that there is an extraordinarily rich literature here and an extraordinarily rich literature here. This one goes back to about 96. This one, this one goes back to about 2004. In five years, I've found one slide that had both of them on the same slide. Right? As Elon knows, I've tried it. I watch like four or five talks a day kind of thing. And so I've defined one person in this area who's even mentioned that these are the same thing. Uh, I think this needs some, to take some serious note. And so in a sense, they're the same thing, but they're sort of opposites. And so maybe that's why it has not gone noticed. Um, but just from a math point of view, we can see we have this sort of the same form. And the same equation, Feynman said something about the same equations have the same solutions. Um, but in this case, they're, they're opposites. And so what is it that we're trying to do? We're trying to build a model. We have a dictionary. This is W. And so we're going to build a linear combination. So this is just kind of a little bit of linear algebra for those who are so inclined. This will be a linear model. And then here we're trying to take the difference of it. And then this is we're gonna, something we're going to minimize. And then we want to make this as sparse as possible. So that's what this term represents. But we can see that in sparse coding, what we have is we have a photograph and we want some code. And in compressed sensing, we have the opposite. We want the data back and we have the code. So in sparse coding, our dictionaries learn. It's adapted, as we're going to see next, how we learn these dictionaries. That was largely the main contribution of this, is to, to explore new algorithms that can learn this w. And then later at the end of the talk, we'll see how if you take a random w, this can do some very incredible things uh, in terms of recovery from undersampled data. So if this doesn't make sense, um, don't feel bad. It took me like three and a half years to make sense of that. Um, what it, again, what it's something that's never been done. There's, a, there's sort of a rich literature here. And then heavy in learning is, is, is very well known. And so amazingly, these two have never been published together. And so we were able to combine LCA and heavy in learning. Um, this one's two equations, and this one's a third. And so we just put these three together, and we're able to learn a dictionary. Uh, and I would argue that this is the, one of the most pl uh, biologically plausible dictionary proposals yet, in terms of these algorithms. We know that sort of we can do this from the CAT studies. And lots of neuroscience research has suggested that if we fire together, rewire together, this is this heavy in learning. And so essentially, that's what this term expresses, and that's able to learn dictionary. And so what you can learn on that is you apply this to natural images. We get sort of these edge type structure. Remember sort of the first time these things pop up, you're like, wow, oh my gosh, it's not just noise anymore. So these things started as noise, and then they slowly evolved into those shapes. Yeah? What is the A in the last slide? Here? Yeah, in the happy end. Oh, oh, yes. Oh, this, should be, this should be a Z in this, in this okay. situation. Sorry about that. This is from the MATLAB version. So that's the MATLAB I used A. In the math, in the math world, you often see Z. So okay, that's a great question. Um, and so you can learn, you can learn these this edge structure. And then what's uh, what's really nice is you can do a block coding on it. 
So what you do is you sort of take these, this, this world, and so this would be uh, a few hundred receptive fields that are all being learned together. Each one of these little squares is a receptive field. And what you can do is you can put a winner-take-all block. So basically you cut, could be cutter this out into big blocks. And then you look which subregion had the most activity. And you only let that region update. And so this is called block sparsity. And I was able to apply this to LCA and to the X-Cube, which has uh, never been reported before. And uh, amazingly, you get these really nice sort of pinwheel type patterns that, again, you see uh, are reminiscent of what they find in the visual cortex, sort of this uh, orientation selectivity that the features, the neighbors respond to similar features. So I'll just go through a bunch of these. I have uh, too many of these, so we can just kind of give you a, a feel for what they look like. Uh, here it is in false color. So again, it's just sort of neat to see the sort of the continuity across these features. Um, one thing that's kind of exciting, and again, I haven't found this reported anywhere in the literature, is that when you train this on uh, color images, you get a color opponency that we see in the visual system. So you get the green, yellow, I'm sorry, uh, blue, yellow, green, red that's uh, witnessed in, um, in the visual system. So you can train these on specific image sets. So here was trained on a type of butterfly known as the zebra butterfly. And so not surprisingly, it's able then to find that that butterfly has this structure, namely this zebra stripe type structure. And so it makes you wonder, you know, the sort of co-evolution of zebras and lions kind of thing, or in this case, the zebra butterfly and whatever eats those, uh, would have to learn a receptive field for that pattern. And if you try it on different butterfly class, you get a very different dictionary set. Um, and so I haven't seen anywhere published where people have done this on different image color categories. Um, this one, uh, this one's the monarch butterfly. And so you can see what's really neat is it, is it separates sort of color features from the orientation selectivity, right? And so these are little features. So this is a neuron that fires when it sees a dark bar at that angle, right? That's what it likes to see in the world. And so when it sees that, it will respond and tell its neighbors. And so we can see sort of just a, 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 from, a, from a glance that and we uh, apply these to different admiral, black swallowtail, uh, zebra, peacock, you know, and so on, you get very different uh, dictionaries out of there. So now I'll talk a little bit more about locally competitive algorithms. Uh, these things belong to a slightly different class of computer. These are what's known as an analog computer. So this is a, a differential analyzer. Uh, these are very famous. The, the biggest one was out of UNC, UCLA. Uh, and it helped during the war. And the problem with these is they're very powerful. They can solve differential equations, but they have round off error. So they're made out of actual gears. They, things actually move. They use real motors. But little bits, if it's off just a little bit, uh, it'll accumulate error. So now we can do this electronically and digitally. Um, but what's really exciting is that you can do this in real time and hardware. And so LCA, it's not quite like uh, other types of uh, von Neumann computer architectures. And ultimately, you'd be able to do this in hardware. And that's what, so people like this, this is Garrett Kenyon at Los Alamos. Um, and he says this equation captures a good chunk of the computer vision and theoretical neuroscience that's been happening lately. And so the, the main motivation behind this, as opposed to the other techniques that might be able to do something similar, is that it's neurologically inspired. And because of that, you can build it out of wires. You don't have to simulate it. You can build it out of capacitors and resistors. And so ideally, you'd want some sort of mechanism. You want a, a machine that takes in some signal, or some brain that takes in some signal, a dictionary, and then outputs the coding of that signal in terms of that dictionary. And so uh, those groups that are working on this, a lot of them are largely startups, um, to do very fast matrix multiplication. There's stochastic analog chips that you can get to do this very, very fast. So again, you know, um, this is for the folks that enjoy math. For the rest of you, you can doze off, wait for the pictures again. But, but really what I want to show here is it's actually not that, that complicated. That we have this, this minimization. We want this difference to be zero. Here's our dictionary. Here's our code. Here's our signal. We want our code to be as short as small as possible. This is our uh, approximate for sparsity, the one norm. And then amazingly, there's a different set of differential equations that will do just that. And so this is 
coupled nonlinear differential equation. It's not as crazy as it looks. There's a leak term. So this is u dot, tells you how u changes over time. This means there's a leak term. This term is going to charge up based on the similarity between the input and a particular dictionary element. So each dictionary element is going to look at the input and say, hey, are you like, is this like me? Am I that edge? If it is, this term will be big. And then finally, the last term tells you the interaction. So this is the competition part. So this two things here represents the dictionary fighting with itself. And so it's kind of like outfielders and saying, I got this. And one of them has to say, I got this. Uh, and then the other one will, will not run towards it. So key to this key to this set of equations is a threshold. This is the nonlinearity. And so famously, uh, this is one is used is just there's a hard and soft threshold. And so these threshold functions were just chosen for mathematical convenience. Yeah. The last one, I'm just trying to understand. Yeah. Uh, was it effectively trying to decorrelate the dictionary uh, uh, elements in the dictionary? So in this case, in this uh, the dictionary is fixed. So in this case, the dictionary is fixed. The phi is not going to change in this, in this situation. Is that your question? Yeah, OK, it's changing. Um, and so it is reported that this is what we end up replacing with x cubed. So this is the threshold function. Um, and here, Kenya reports that this was just chosen for mathematical convenience. And so what we're excited about is replacing that with the cube. That's basically the same thing. I was going to skip that one. Um, Here's what it looks like in MATLAB. And so I promise you it's two lines of MATLAB. So those are the two lines. This is just a loop, and it's just some setup. Um, and so surprising, surprisingly, the most complicated thing in here is just multiplication. So there's not any sort of weird uh, happenings that you couldn't do in the brain. Um, this just shows you how you can reproduce a patch. You have an input patch, and then you're going to fake it, right? So you're going to have these other patches that aren't the real patch, but they look just like it. And so the error will be very small. And so just the idea is that we're going to build an approximation. Just like when you squish a photograph, you take a photograph with your cell phone camera, you don't send the actual photograph to somebody, but the photograph they get, they can't tell. Right? So it's a good approximation. They can't tell that you've even squished it. Looks like the original. Uh, so here you can, you can see just barely, you know, not quite exactly the same. So. Uh, Sort of the main, one of the main results that we did with this is we took uh, videos, we were saying from different classifications, and we tried to recognize this. So we want to have computers understand human behavior, human actions, to understand our intentions and goals, so that we can co and cooperate safely, for example. Um, you can imagine like in a nursing home scenario for fall detection, um, or uh, say at the beach, right? You'd want to have something like an automatic safety type system that keeps track of people. So what we can do is we can take images from different classes or frames from different classes for different movies. So here we have three classes. We're going to take little patches, little overlapping patches from the videos. We're going to separate those into training and testing. We're going to then vectorize them. So amazingly, you can take an image and just kind of stretch it out. So I think this is kind of surprising, but you can, an image is made up of pixels. And then you can just say that's the first, that's the second, that's the third, and you can just make a list and turn it into a vertical. And so almost everything that's been done is you've taken a small little piece of the world and you've done it as a stretched out vertically. This was surprising, right? When I realized that you can get a, kind of get away with that, uh, that was a sort of conceptual leap. It seems like it's too strong a thing to do. So you take all these patches. They now live as columns. You can then take these columns from each class and you combine them together. You now have what we call a dictionary library. And so it's a dictionary, but it has three different known sections. Right? So you know what these sections are. Then later you take a new piece. You can say, I don't know what this test patch is. Can you please express it in terms of things I do know? LCA will do that for us. See, so LCA then will tell us the relative percentage of each dictionary that was used. And it will tell us we use that much of this one, such as that one, and so on. And then because the blue there wins, that will be classified as blue. So that's what we did with, with frames. We have frames of a video. So it's a sequence of photographs. We then take little little sugar cubes, blocks out of that video. So we can think of this as space and time. So two dimensions of space and one of time. Then we can take one and we pretend like we don't know what it is. What type of video did this little cube come from? We can compare it with what we do know. We can say build it out of these. 
It will say, okay, I'll build it, and I made it using that, that, this, this, and this. Well, it used three blues, one green, and one red, so the class will be decided as blue. So we can see when we run that in MATLAB, we can take a video, and we can look here, sort of roughly, that dictionary broken into three pieces. We can see there's more activation in the first piece, and so therefore we can assign it the first class. Uh, we ran 127 videos on this. It only got uh, a couple wrong. Uh, very exciting to do this with textures. And so we've trained a texture data set. This is very exciting for medical imaging. Um, you can see your brain is responding very differently to those four sections. You have dictionaries that are appropriate for those textures, and you're invoking them. So you can see if we train this on um, you know, over a dozen different textures, we get, again, with the butterflies, we get a very different dictionary for each class. Marble and granite looks very different than brick. Uh, so there's our butterflies. We can see what that looks like again, to remind you. And again, we can classify those as well. We can take a collection. We take a 1,000 patches at a time. And we can say, hey, where did those patches come from? And this day, we say that mo you know, most of the time, they came from that section. So we'll classify that cluster as from that class. So the x cubed thresholding, this we're really excited about, because this is sort of really off the map uh, kind of stuff. Uh, in terms of that's nowhere in the literature. So this was just randomly, um, I was watching a YouTube talk with Christoph Koch, and halfway through his talk, he says, he was talking about a completely different experiment. He was trying to find an exponential law, um, something completely different, um, not even related to vision, something with looming stimulus, but um, well, that's, that is uh, vision. But what I mean is he was not doing sparse coding or anything like this. It was just, he was just reporting his data. And this was actually not the result they wanted. So his hypothesis was that it was going to be an exponential law, and that's what they were really looking for. So he was rather disappointed in his, in his talk. And he says, yeah, we got a third power. And I'm like, woo -hoo. So uh, we found that you know, third power, those who do modeling, it shows up a lot in neuro models. Um, so there's what third power looks like, not too fancy. And amazingly, if we look and see, or not so amazing, right, rather pedestrian, but if we look at this thresholding curve in blue, which is the sort of the classic from the sparse modeling literature, and then we replace that with a cube, we can see, okay, it's gonna do essentially the same thing for us, but yet we know now that the red curve is what's reported that neurons do. Uh, 